out a couple minutes before we, uh, you know, I'll have Linda start uh, the first half and I'll finish the second half. Uh, Linda, of course, everyone knows Linda, Linda Reshkin, and she is uh, not only an awesome trader, but she's my wife. Ha ha. And lucky me. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm just starting out this way because we seem to always kind of run out and at the very end. So I want to make sure that you know that you can check out Linda and DamonTrade.com. That's our trading room if you're interested in checking it out. And, uh, you know, our, you know, we post on Twitter every day. Uh, just putting up this quick disclosure. Um, it's the right thing to do. Uh, you know, most everybody knows that um, you don't trade with your last buck. And, uh, you know, that futures is, you know, uh, can be a little bit risky because of the leverage. Of course, you know, that can be a double-edged sword, but it's also can be good. But um, we're not guaranteeing anything, just like anything else. And uh, we're going to do our best to try to give you something in one hour, which is not very easy, but we're going to, especially on today, today we had a huge day. So, you know, <laughs> I got way too many slides and we're going to try to fit some stuff in. But um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Linda. Linda, are you there? I sure am. Woohoo! All right. Do me a favor. Uh, go ahead and share, you know, what screen you want. I can't share until you have stopped sharing. Oh, there you about go. about that? I know. There you go. Now you can Just share. Just so you guys understand, okay, this is why it's sort of convoluted here is because uh, during the day, you know, Damon and I are trading and we have like actually four Zoom videos going on simultaneously, which of course they're not all like live or active, but I'm always showing my screen. Damon's always showing his market profile stuff. And then we have uh, two trade station things that uh, have some scans and some automated programs, which I'll uh, just give you some insight to uh, for a very brief moment. But uh, Damon, can you see my screen up here? Is this Yes. Uh, no, okay. I see it. It looks great. All right. So um, what I want to do is give you guys two things to think about going forward, because that's the whole point. You tune in to us to get some type of strategy or insight into the market, something that you can use going forward. And uh, so what I wanted to do is just present to you some concepts because um, for me, everything is about concepts and context. So for example, you can backtest any indicator under the sun and it is not going to show a positive expectation unless you greatly filter it to put it in a proper context. And then you, of course, risk the, uh, you know, fine line of slightly curve fitting and optimizing and stuff like that. So with that said, canned indicators and so forth are good, useful tools because they are merely highlighting what is there in the charts. So I pretty much trade off of the, uh, the swing highs and the swing lows. But more importantly to me are the components that put something into a context. So I'm going to show you two little trades. One was on Friday and one was today. And they are all about context. And so what you see up here is my game board, as I like to call it, uh, starting off each day. And what I do is I simply put in, if you can see over here on the left side of this chart, I have the previous day's low and the previous day's high, which was just buried right here. It was that 81.25. And then the orange bands are the Globex. Okay. So I'm very much Globex highs and lows, previous days, highs and lows, and gaps, because they are the most visible chart points to all market participants out there. So Paul Tudor Jones sees the gaps, you know, Lewis Bacon sees the highs and lows, all the big money sees the highs and the lows and the gap areas. And that's what's important to me for the market psychology. That is where the volume comes in. If you drill down to a 10 second chart, you will see the volume come in at at these swing highs and lows, even intraday. So let's dial it back down and go to some context. And this is a very simple rule of thumb. I'm going to start off with Friday. And I wanted to simply point out to you a very simple thing that you can watch going forward. And I back this up to Friday's 
trading. So what you see here on my tick chart with these e-minis, which is just a way of condensing the overnight data is, you know, very well-defined highs and lows. And of course, this visible <clears throat> uh, entity up here, which we tested today, oh, shock and awe, but we had this nice ABC down type of rhythm. And trust me, it is not all clean and pretty and symmetrical when we get down and dirty and look at five-minute charts. There is a ton of pardon me, I was about to use a four letter word of noise. Okay. And so that is the challenge for a trader trading real time is to deal with the noise. So I find that if I go out to a higher time frame, I can cut down through that noise. So here was our basic structure, this kind of ABC, and it was confirmed with this DAX on this 120 minute chart. I adore 120 minute charts for the higher time frame. Now throw this time frame stuff out the window, throw the indicators and the pretty colored bars out the window. What I simply want you to see is the fact that in the afternoon session, meaning after 12 noon central time, or you can use 1130 central time. There's not really a perfect time, but you can see that the market breadth, this is CQG. So it shows the advancing issues minus the declining issues. The market breadth started making new highs, but more importantly, one of my primary indicators is this VIX. And you can use the VXX should you so desire. So at that point, we saw the VIX start to make new lows on the day. And we also had a very high tick reading. Now, honestly, CQG's ticks suck. So I use TradeStation's ticks, but you can still see that there was a high tick reading here indicating by program activity supply demand imbalance it's driving the price and so at this point we were pretty sure that there was a high probability that the market was going to close on its highs or at the very least the upper end of its range so this was a pretty good sweet spot here in the afternoon session where we went from 31.55 up to 31.75 and then even a little bit higher up to 80. So I kind of chopped this back uh, off. So that is number one thing for you guys to pay attention as you go into the afternoon session. One is price trading above or below the opening price. Very simple. Two, are we starting to see new highs or lows in these market internals? And that should be a confirming factor. I look at the VIX, the market breadth, and then the ticks, which are highly correlated with the market breadth. Okay? Simple, simple. So we got that construct down. Um, when you see this ABC pattern on the DAX, I've often called that the power buy because ABCs are far more powerful than a simple flag for many reasons because you start to spend a little bit more time in that consolidation. So forms of ABC can be a bi divergence or a, you know, a symmetrical ABC. All these things have a two part wave, the dump, bump, bump. So that is where when we back tested this stuff for my fund, you will find the optimal risk reward. Okay. If you go in for entry at an ABC and again, a divergence also um, uh, qualifies as an ABC. So you guys going forward, be aware if you start to make new highs on the day and that VIX is making new lows on the day, there's extremely high odds that you will close at the upper end of your range. Now, the exception to that rule is if we have an extremely light volume day, because on light volume, we do not have the higher time frame player to move that market to a new value level. Okay, so just be aware that any time you have suboptimal um, 
volume, you might as well just play a constant reversion to the mean type of game during the day, which would imply that we would fade the tick extremes, you know, or just small little scalp trades, you know, back to the moving average. Okay, let's take a look at today because we have the flip side of that coin where um, this was my game board coming into today. And it, interestingly, we saw the trend day up the whole time in this VIX. Okay, so what did this smart money know that they were buying puts and buying puts? And it was even ironic that they painted the tape a little bit with this Russell. Okay, but we'll look at that in a minute. More importantly, I simply want to draw your attention to the fact that when the price starts dropping below that opening price and in the afternoon session and you get this VIX making new highs in the afternoon session, voila, once again, it's saying stay to the short side. And all afternoon I was telling people online, do not look to buy, do not look to buy, you know, buy divergences because they will form against a trend. Divergences form against a trend. So be mindful if it's this higher trend. So this is the stuff that I trade off, okay? I look at these market internals. I want to see the basic structure. And let's just look at one or two other caveats here that formed with today's action and things that you can trade with going forward. It's all about market structure for me. So we got this where the VIX was making new highs in the afternoon, the S&Ps, the opening price was 3275 We were selling down below that. Once you're below that opening price and you see that VIX making new highs and so forth, so forth, so forth, you can see here, this is a five minute chart of the market breadth. Of course, the breadth reflects the small caps getting wailed on. And lastly, as extra confirmation, here at one o'clock, you had the ticks making new lows on the day. So that is added confirmation that you are going to continue down. So here's another thing that I like to do. You can see here this green line and this red line previous days high and low my most important indicator just give me those previous days highs and lows to frame things out and then we have the globex high and low okay so here what we had was a classic bit of a trap of course we went up and everybody knows that we tested that previous swing high up here here is a good rule of thumb draw a box around a rectangle around that previous range and if you look above and you fail okay this is sort of market profile talk which damon specializes in he was on the trading floor since 1978 and i consider him to be truly an expert on auction theory because he was in those pits for what 30 years 25 years so he sees those dynamics of the <laughs> auction theory and putting things in context so it's a failed auction and once you come back down into that previous range we've got two constructs first look for the price to trade to the middle of that range rule number one and if we cannot hold here tomorrow then we will go back down to our 3107 which is a value area where the price rotated numerous times and so we see these certain levels constantly traded with now coming in this morning let me just show you we also had on our early morning game plan, this is our sheet where we look for the patterns that will set up during the day before the markets open. We had two things. You can see here this Dow, this daily Dow chart. Once again, look above and fail. So it was a false breakout. Now, that does not mean that it can't go higher later on. It means that this level right here, 
was the key for the day. And of course, our Russell had this triangle. They gave a little bit of a hook here by trying to get something going, but it is still in a range. And lastly, I wanted to point out this NASDAQ. This is important. So just so you don't get too carried away thinking that the end of the world and the end of the uh, intermediate term swing has come, it's not because this is an extended run. This is the NASDAQ. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight bars close above, and we got our first close down below. So it was a wide range reversal, meaning this outside down bar. So we want to be respectful of that. But the model still suggests that there will be upside. I went home long some things. There will be upside, at least just to poke above that 5 SMA. Okay, so all of these things are conceptual. Okay, that's what I want to drill to you. This previous high and low, conceptual. Globex high and low, conceptual. If I look at the, uh, this is my confirmation, non-confirmation page. So at the top, what did we see? We saw the S&Ps making a higher high at the same time that this is the Dow here. Sorry about that. At the here's the S and P making a higher high at the same time, the Nasdaq was making a lower high. This uh, Russell was the hook, but once we broke down and started rolling over, and I want to show you one of my all-time favorite patterns. No indicators needed. This is this failed flag. This failed retest. It's a failure test. You see that? So this is all simple swing highs and swing lows. We failed to get that full retest up and it's a sell stop when you come back down below that low. So perfectly simple in terms of framing stuff out. Um, and it's just a matter of Mr. Market is the greatest educator there is. The more time that you sit in front of the screen and make your notes, okay, the better the trader that you will become because you have to see these things for yourself. So always in the morning, mark off that Globex high and low, the previous day's high and low, any gaps, basis the pit session, because I tell you, it's like when we started coming down, that was the first thing I was looking for is what is the level that is going to close that gap in that NASDAQ. Okay, so as a floor trader, we are also um, always concerned with the confirmation, non-confirmation. So here's what I was looking at with the uh, NASDAQ shares. And these are my favorite trading shares. I do trade stocks as well, stocks and options. So I wanted to show you a very simple thing because we were watching this this morning and we did make some trades. The NASDAQ was the early strength leader. And so you can see if I just have all these five minute charts up here, all I have is this green line is the previous day's high and the red line is the previous day's low. So this morning, the main easy plays were with a Microsoft, which had this nice little pullback here to the previous day's high forming a flag. And we caught this Google flag right here, the pullback, right? Okay, so you can see, the easy stuff should stick out at you. If it's just noise, like, okay, to me, this Qualcomm here, that's noise, okay? There is so much of the time, guys, that I have no freaking clue what is going on. There's a lot of times, it's just waiting until you see a recognizable pattern. That is the whole key. It's the patience. So once we started, we got our full retest up and we started noticing a lot of these shares like this Adobe failed to make a full retest up. Twitter failed to make a full retest up. So you can play this game, confirmation, non-confirmation with indices, 
with groups of stocks, and then it will give you confidence, okay? You don't have to trade all this stuff, but use these other markets like indicators, okay? Because the price action is always going to tell you the best. So once we started to see Adobe come down, and here is the previous day's low, we saw a lot of shares making outside down days. Look at this Shopify here. It got goose right down to its daily moving average. We had a lot of early leadership to the downside, NVIDIA, before that NAS took that outside down bar. Okay, so those are the things that I look at and that I comment on throughout the day and that we trade throughout the day. Pretty basic, pretty simple. And, uh, you know, it, the game just does not really change for me. But the whole trick is putting things in context. So take this home with you. Previous day's highs and lows. That's all what Taylor was about, watching the action around there. You can see this NASDAQ low. It was a little bit of a magnet, okay? And then tomorrow we'll have a new day. We'll have an entirely new uh, game board. So I mentioned to you that I actually did take some uh, trades home overnight. And these were some things that I bought earlier. So I just want to give you guys a little taste of what I have been working on for the last year. Um, you might find it interesting, you might not. I had some of the best um, technical support with my hedge fund in terms of doing modeling and back testing and so forth. It is damn near impossible to have a mechanical system, okay? Seriously. It's not like we can just have a little printing press on an island and grind this stuff out. It is a lot of work. It is a lot of patience. And, uh, you know, it's a performance-oriented discipline. I have a very difficult time, you know, trying to trade and trying to do anything else. But for the last year, I have been consulting with um, these two uh Stanford graduate students doing uh, artificial intelligence. So we, I started doing neural networks actually in 1992. So this is the game now that I play and these signals are all generated mechanically, systematically, okay, with these stocks. And this is about the best that I can come up with for an edge. And these little arrows here, I simply put it on one day and exit it the next day, okay? So um, you can see sometimes they run two, three, four, five days, you know, more power to you if you grab something from that, but my game is in one day and out the next day because there is a lot of edge to holding things overnight. And I'm sure that you have seen the studies now that show that 85% of the market's overall gains have been made outside the U.S. session. What is a poor soul to do if you want to try something beyond day trading? So for me, I, you know, it's in one day, out the next day, and that's where my edge is. So I do these things with stocks. I do them with options. So I actually, uh, now I know I'm going to shoot myself in the foot for jinxing uh, this, but I went home long some Johnson & Johnson. We talked about this very early in the day, these drug stocks, and I went home long some uh, win. And this works as well on futures. So this is a little bit, not, I'm not, I don't sell this. I'm not trying to pitch you on anything. I have absolutely nothing to sell other than our good old family and comrades throughout the day that we trade with. But I wanted to show you that there is a huge edge to in one day and out the next day. And we have no idea what's going to happen three or four days out. So um, those are some of the things that I have been working on. And I want to leave plenty of time for Damon to talk because this is the first time ever these last three months that he and I have been able to trade together. And, you know, he started on the floor back in 1978 and I've been trading full time, full time as a professional 
for 40 years. That means that I've made my living with my trading profits. Okay. I have not made my living, you know, doing other activities, but my living has been derived from my trading off uh, profits. 100%. So that's, uh, you know, okay, that's not 100% true, because with the hedge fund, we definitely had a management fee, which helped cover a lot of costs. But um, my point being that here, we are trading together. And every day, I learn from him. Okay, I'm like, now what is he seeing? Why is he going in and buying the crude there? It's like my stuff looks like it's kind of at the top of the swing, like it's overbought, you know? And uh, <laughs> sure enough, I was like, I would never pick those spots, but he goes in there and he picks off 20, 30 ticks. And, uh, you know, it's uh, so then I go back and I study and I say, well, what was he looking at? And I got the sense that he definitely is very attuned to the time of day, to the volume characteristics at certain times of the day, and that is his game. So my point being, after 40 years, and despite having all this gobbledygook like artificial intelligence, every day I am still studying the market and learning from other people, like my husband or other people uh, you know, in our chat room, always so i know that i'll uh, you know never think that you know everything everybody has something to offer even if it's just a different way of looking at the market so i hope i have expanded you know your your vision as to what i look at the swing highs and swing lows the daily candlestick structure this is a five period simple moving average i've lectured on that on the past so I'm looking for us to do a little bit of a reaction back up. With that, I'm handing over the floor to my lovely husband, Mr. Damon Pavlados. You there? Do I need to wow. the share here? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. Uh, let me get this going here. Wow. Let's, you're a hard act to follow. I'm already out of breath just listen yeah that was that was a big wow wow that was hey, wow i didn't yeah. even have any caffeine can you believe that i mean usually i, I drink caffeine. like at least a, an iced coffee or something you know but i i wanted just to emphasize the added importance of putting things into context so there you go <laughs> all right i don't know can you see my screen and hear me looks great okay I just throw this up because I always think it's fun to start with. You know, I think Barry was on the floor previous to this and he was talking. Um, so, yeah, Linda's right. You know, uh, I, the whole auction thing, you know, from, for me, coming from the floor really speaks to me. In fact, I owned a liquidation company and I went to over 200 auctions. So when I compare the two, it's pretty crazy. And, you know, the floor, the whole thing about the floor is uh, it, it was pure auction, you know, uh, markets, you know, bidding up until there's fair value and then it will stop. It'll find a place where both sides could trade. And this is uh, just some old pictures that I had. Um, but the truth of the matter is the guys in the pit, uh, I started actually in 1977. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to split hairs. It, it, really makes me feel old. You're aging yourself. I am. I am. Jeez. Um, but anyway, you know, the same things in the pit is what we try to see on the screen, right? We, we look at price behavior. The, the guys in the pit, including myself, if we made a new high, we wanted to see how did we test the high? Did we test it with volume? Did, was Goldman buying new highs? If Goldman was buying, I'm buying, right? But if no one's buying and I'm the only guy buying at the top, I'm in trouble, right? So we look at price behavior. We look at volume at that high, you know, and we look at where, where did the market reverse, you know? And we look at overnight action, which back then wasn't a big deal. But after 2008, I put a lot of value, be, uh, you know, behind the overnight action, you know. And I, as you know, most of you who follow me on Twitter, or you're in the trading room, I also use market profile, but I split it out from uh, into three sections, the US day session, Asia and Europe, because it's really important to see the different parts of the world that are trade, uh, you know, trade art markets and see how they react to them. And the tops and bottoms made during those times have been very important to me. It's been great. 
So anyway, one more thing before we get on, uh, go, go forward. You know, the, the market uh, does this thing where we either have a consolidation kind of type of market or we have a trending market, right? So we either are in balance, we're consolidating, we're going sideways and you know going back and forth, or we come out of balance and that's where uh, you need real participation, right? By the big funds and institutions, not the little guys. You know, I used to joke and call the little guys, including myself, pea shooters, you know. You're not, you know, uh, 10 or 20 lots is not gonna move the market to new highs in the S&P. So even though today that would be 200 e minis but whatever. Um, it's the big, you know, the bigger, longer term time frame traders, right? Okay, it's been a long day, a big, big market, a big day for us. Um, okay, so volume was real important to me. I'm just gonna fly through this. I'm gonna try to go as quick as I can. I got way too much information. <clears throat> but anyway, volume is for me very important because it's the only real time indicator, right? And uh, you know, in milliseconds, you get to see the volume, right? Uh, that's really important. In in the old days, they had this three day average that you know they would take an estimate of three days at ten o'clock, divided by three, and throw that up there. It was useless. We used to laugh at it, but the edge was in the pit because you could see the volume. Right now, we have a flat uh, landscape here that everybody can you know a fair uh, fair trading um, that you know everybody can. Um, see uh you know uh it can participate in right you know so um and you know when when you have light volume you can see you know that's usually when you know rallies will fail on light volume that kind of thing or maybe you have real strong volume at the end of a trend yeah so let's let's just let me just show you a couple of things so here's um a volume candle right for instance uh photon trader is uh a software that I, I found and developed and everything, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you can use volume in different ways, different systems. I'm not trying to sell you anything, but these volume candles, what, what happens is when the volume gets, you know, bigger and deeper, uh, the, the candle itself will widen. Uh, I believe I, I like to keep things simple and I'm a very visual kind of right brainer type of guy. I don't like, reading numbers, I like to see things. And so for me, it's visual. When this candle gets wider and wider and wider and keeps going, market's trending, we got something going here. Volume dies, what do we do? We consolidate and then it continues. Again, this would be like we're balancing around here, we get a trend, we come out of balance, we, try, we balance and we come out of it. Okay. Here's the difference of seeing the volume like this versus this. This is the same chart down here. It's a candle chart. This is the breakout here. You're a little bit more convinced when you see the volume growing when you get above these highs. But you wouldn't know that here. By, by here, you're like, oh, did I miss it? Should I get in? So it's that kind of thing. So here's another example of big up move on the five minute, just the NAS very light volume in the pullback, which is what, a bull flag, right? And then we continue the trend. We come back out, we die. We come back out of a good volume, we die, we keep going. So it gives you the confidence. Um, look at this snapshot today. I, I try to throw as much as I could in there and I don't know what I'm gonna be able to show you, but take a look at today. Here's a good example. When the market topped out and started a break, you know, you get these little bear flags, but you could see how volume died. Small little bars, yes, you know, you, you get out the uh, the weak shorts, they, they cover and they, oh, I made a little money. And then boosh, right? Another big push down, good volume. And then here, this is at the end of the day, we started to consolidate, but at the end of the day, um, I do this thing the last half an hour because I used to execute for the big funds. I know that there is going to be some pretty good selling here and then the market ends up and this is the three o'clock close. You see the big volume. Uh, I'd circle these for a reason. Uh, retests of these highs uh, are very important. If I see a retest of the high and it spikes and then it's low volume, 
that's a failed auction to me, especially if it retests it on low volume. And maybe you have the 310 oscillator or some oscillator giving you a momentum uh, divergence. So you got all that, and then you, you can see this coming down, right? So now over to the right, this is kind of just a snapshot what I showed during the day to the trading room that you know you could see. Um, I, I try to keep it a little bit more simple because we tend to overanalyze everything. So you can look at a simple chart and make money if you understand price behavior, price action, and time versus price, you know, that kind of thing. Well, this is a market profile. Now, this is what I break out. This, this structure here is the U.S. day session. This is Asia, and this is Europe. So... This low was a retest of Asia, see? So that's why I like to break it out because if you were to go combine these into 24 hours, you don't know how this action, price action occurred. Very important and the volume has picked up in the night session and these highs and lows have been tested often. We always test the high and low of Globex. So here's a good example. We opened up here, we went up, we tried to balance it got slippery, market balance over here. And then once we got below the previous, this is what they call the value area where most of the trading took place, like six, six, uh, what's it, 67% took place here and here. We got below it, single prints, one, one 30 minute period. We, we took a little oasis here for a minute. You could see you know, some levels I had here and then it continued. So the market's all about levels, you know, and, and uh, reversals and, and uh, price behavior, you know, volume at price. And that's my personal thing. Listen, there's all kinds of indicators out there. And if you're making money with your indicators, don't even watch this. You don't need it, right? Um, but if you can walk away and take something away from this, you know, I'm happy. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, both Linda and myself have traded separately. I ran my company. She did her hedge fund for years and we just decided to do this trading room and it's been a lot of fun. But anyway, so this is just a, a quick example. You could use different moving averages. I just happened to realize I got these moving averages in a snapshot. You can use the Keltners. I like the Keltners. Linda uses Keltners or the 20 EMA with the 5 EMA. Um, this is just a 30 high moving average and a 30 low. And it just tells me if we're below this, you know, and, and you know, the 10 is momentum's pointing down. I look at everything together to try to sum up what do we have going here? And this is just a paint bar thing that I designed here, just showing, uh, you know, selling continued here. We didn't have a three bar reversal the way I look at it. This is just a snapshot of my trade station where I have 5, 15, 30, and a 60 in a daily. <clears throat> so let's, let's look at how this looks when, this is the US close. Look at how much volume here, just on this day. Asia opens up, this is how it looks on a bar chart, right? And then this is Europe. So you can see how the market treated, uh, you know, the price action during the, you know, uh, at night, okay? Uh, I hope I'm <laughs> making sense of not going too fast, but I want to get as much as I can. And this is just simply showing that, you know, the volume behind there, you look under the hood. I don't like these things. I'm just showing you, you know, for those people who are big on the volume, is that when you have increased volume, sometimes what happens is you have a climax at the low with a lot of volume, and that's usually the end of a, a trend. And you could see on this day, we had triple the range, triple or you know double the volume of average volume, 10 day average. So you're gonna get this kind of, you see on the left side, this multiple distribution, I call it, right? This is four distributions, right? Um, that just says that there's some pretty big institutions moving it to new low, you know, lows. So you see a little distribution, then it can't hang on and you get more selling and more selling, more selling. It's not the little ones and twos and fives. You want to pay attention to that. Who's in control of the market? Okay, so um, pockets, you know, I, I this is just a simple way to look at these reversals. Way back, uh, Linda 
it's, it's interesting. I'll make it two seconds here, but for 15 years, Linda was a friend and client and she used to have a fund and I used to execute on it. I had my own execution operation where I executed for a lot of funds like Paul Tudor Jones, Louis Bacon, Toby Crable, and Linda had a big fund. And so one day she said, what do you think? And I said, we're coming into the pocket. And she goes, what's the pocket? Well, it's basically just the way I look at it. It's a reversal. If you look at this bottom pocket and think of your own pants pocket, right? A retest of this pocket is supposed to hold, right? So we come right into it and we hold, just like you put five quarters in your pocket, you should hold five quarters. You put 10, you put 15. But if you put 40 quarters in your pocket, it might put a hole into it, right? And once it breaks this pocket, you see we retested and retested, it looks like this, you know? And then we start a trend. And then this is how this panned out afterwards. You know, it was, we broke this consolidation. Often consolidations uh, are pockets testing pockets. And it's just a smaller, you know, short-term time frame traders, you know, just bouncing around until finally you get some follow through with volume and you start the trend. Okay. Here's an example where I just drew in the bottom pockets. You know, we tested the, these this area so many times, but when we came out of it, we had a real good sell-off. And then at that point, what do we do? We pulled back up to the breakout level and we went down and we went right back up to the, the pocket and we came back down. If you, if you try to keep it a little bit simpler and you know, you can't throw a million indicators at you, at, at you and try to figure it all out at once, it's just too much. You know, if you can't understand basic price action, and price behavior, everything else is not going to make a whole lot of sense. You know, uh, we tend to make it a little bit complicated. On the floor, these guys didn't even have charts. I had a charting service and it would buy it from me. And that started in 79. I was just, I started reading on charts and hand doing charts. And, and uh, you know, I found out that, you know, nobody really knew what they were doing with, with levels. And, and I started selling that as well, you know because I traded and I had my own uh, execution operation. So when you look at the big picture, here's the daily, and this is with volume over the daily. It works the same way. We had a pocket, we went up, we got a pocket there, we held here, we went up, we took this level out and we go to the next level. We came back and we test this, you know. So if you think of it that way, you might just be able to break it down a little bit easier, okay? Um, <clears throat> Here's uh, something I want to uh, show you too. Bull trends and bear trends, right? Bull trends take a long time. It's a grind. And most traders have a tough time trading in a bull market. Let's face it, even this, this rally that we had, you know, everyone's looking for the downside. And when they see a market moving up slowly, what do they say? Oh, it looks heavy. <laughs> No, when it breaks, you're going to know that it's time to get short. But the, the, the interesting about bull markets and bear markets is you see this big uptrend, two days down. We took out more than half of it in two days in this entire uptrend. You know, and this is just uh, volume monthly, uh, yearly volume uh, overlaid on this uh, weekly chart. This is a weekly. But you could just see how long we churn. Boom right? Up, boom. So understand the difference. You know, bull markets are grind. Picture this as a high rise. They start a high rise. It takes forever to build. But when it's time to knock down a building, they blow it up and it's done in a day. So think of it that way. Just trying to add common sense. Oh, by the way, I had to show this. This was the, uh, remember that May crude, you know, never say never. Right. Oh, it can't go negative. Oh, my God. I mean, that was horrible. But I always preach in the trading room. Everybody knows when I trade, I always have a stop and a target, you, you know, because you never know when some outlier comes in like this. It, it wiped out a bunch of huge funds because of this. Right. Um, this is the last 30 minutes that Linda was talking about. You know, I always look to, to try to, you know, capture that and get the wind behind my back. And this is the three o'clock close right here, and then it dies. 
you get this huge move, right? NASDAQ, SPUs, you know. And here's the same thing. Uh, uh, this is the Russell. This is the 3 o'clock close. And this is the NAS. I'm sorry, the uh, YMs, right? Um, that's a whole thing that I don't have time to get into. But for sure, the long and short funds and all the MLCs and buy programs and sell programs are done in the first and last hour, 90% uh, 90 per, 90 of it. You very rarely have somebody do it in the middle of the day. And, and why? Because I used to execute for so long uh, in these markets, right? Um, let's talk real quick about uh, market profile because we don't have much time. It was created by Peel Stoudemire. It was when there was no volume and he wanted to figure out to see uh, some kind of data distribution on a vertical axis to be able to see where the, the big areas are in all the levels. That's where it came from. And um, it, and but it, the distributions charge started way 40 years ago, 50, I found one in 1920, I couldn't find it. But this is in uh, Japan. It was a train station. Same thing. It's, you know, <laughs> it looks like market profile. And this is basically all it is, right? If you take the A period is the first 30 minute periods, B is the second 30, but you know, they condense it. Um, I'm going to try to just jump through here. So this would be expanded out into a bar chart. Here's a 30 minute, right? Every one of these is just 30 minutes, which by the way, the ABC was purely a a letter that they would put by the time clock on the trading floor. So if you traded between seven, seven thirty, you looked up there if, and you made a trade, you wrote on your trading card, A. So they knew it was in the first 30 minutes. Well, he took that and he turned it into a distribution bell curve. So, you know, there's initial balance is the first hour, you know, to try to sum up where we're going, you know, in, in, and build. This is how it looks as you build it. And then you get this, right? You know, uh, the value area is where, you know, most of the, actually this is a little adjusted, but is where 67%, basically some use 70% of the trading takes place. When you come out of that area where most of the trading took place, you wanna look at volume, you wanna see it, you know, momentum and see if it's for real or not. Otherwise, it's a fade, okay? Now, I know this is a lot for you to understand. I'm just jumping through this. Um, <clears throat> this is the point of control where most of the trading took place. It's like the mean. You know, the market goes up, comes back down, goes down, comes back up when you have this type of formation. And formations can tell you a lot. Initial balance, we went through that. Uh, closing range is just, you know, the very end of the day. Um, selling tails, these are spikes. If you were to just, you know, do this, this is a spike. Um, this is how this structure looks when you extend, expand it out, right? And volume profiles. I like volume on profiles too. The high volume and low volumes, they attract and detract. So when you see my Twitter charts, I'm using all kinds of things to determine these levels, right? So, you know, you know, the volume profiles can give you, see where the market interest was at any given price, right? It helps with the support and resistance areas um, because everything is about levels. When something reverses and, and sells off and it's a major spike high, there's a reason for that, that you have to respect it. And then until it actually penetrates it with some vengeance, right? Um, I'm just going to flip through this here real quick. This is a, so here's the difference. Here's a market profile. This is window trader that I use. I like window trader. This is it broken out. This is how a bar chart would look. And this is how the volume candles. This is all the same thing, right? Real quick, live auction. It's two things. It's, it, it consists of the short, the long-term traders, the hedge funds, institutions, right? And the short-term traders, the day traders, black box market making, you know, where they go for two, three, four, six. At the end of the day, you want to decide who's got control of the market and that you can attack it, okay? This, this is like a, we opened here and we went straight up. This is a day where the longer-term traders have control of the market and this is what it looks like. Right. And this is where the short term traders, they just chop around the point of control. 
Okay. So this is how I break out Europe and Asia. This is how it looks when you see my Twitter. This is how it looks when we're in balance, where we have price overlap and all and we're trading. And then what happens? We get these triple or double distributions that will come out of it to find a new place to balance. And the market's always looking to balance. When it comes out of it, you want to watch how how does it come out of it? Is it volume or not? Right. Um, you know, just things like this, you know, you could see overreactions also are met with a, a reverse reaction usually, but you could see this a little bit better in market profile. Um, here's just a nice trend. What does it do? It comes up to this high volume node that becomes resistance. Okay. And, and so you want to use that knowing if you're, you're long, you're going to want to, you know, get out here. You know, or you you might short against this level because that's a good level. It would take a lot to get above there after this big run up. Okay. Um, same thing. Resistance coming up to here. I know I'm flying. <laughs> Woohoo. Okay. So uh, when you see big levels like this and you see these major lows, and you could see here, uh, this was uh, this was the U.S. day session, right? I really think it's a, a you know a good sell signal when you can't take out right on some kind of spike like that you can't take out the globex high then you get this major failure and you could see the sell off so look at the retest of the globex highs and lows if they fail they usually try to take them out if they fail then you can see a reaction to the other side uh, gaps you can see the gaps here you know, this this got this filled the gap. We gapped up higher, right? This is where we open. What do we do? We went right down into the gap and then we moved up. Gaps, you know, don't always get filled right away, but they're more evident for me. Uh, the U.S. gaps on the way I split it out. Same like here. We didn't fill this gap till all the way over here. Three days later. So whoever tells you you got to fill a gap in a day, run for the hills because it's that's old stuff. I mean, back in the day, uh, on the floor, everybody said gap and fill, gap and fill. And it's not anymore. <laughs> Same here. All right. Um, all right. So before I get into this here, uh, yeah, I don't know if we have much time to look at the markets, but um, anyway, let me just say one real quick thing. Uh, we are going to do a Sunday night, uh, July 19th. We're going to do a, I believe it's 8 o'clock uh, Eastern, 7 o'clock Central, uh, where we can get into to this a little bit more. We're going to have some fun, look at the markets live. If anybody's interested, I'll put this uh, link in the room. Uh, that will be the 19th. And, of course, if you're interested in the trading room, you don't have to sign up. You can read about it here. Um, it's just, uh, it's a lot of fun. We, we show our, our trades, we show our charts. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, you know, it's something if you're interested where we do it eight hours a day and uh, we do also some night sessions where we more like 12 hours a day. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I mean, by the way, I am so exhausted after today. It's so like, it's like, uh, it's, it's not easy, but, um, yeah, we put a lot into it, but we have fun. And, uh, there's a lot of great traders from all over the world that are in there that you could talk to. And, and, um, uh, I like it cause it reminds me of the floor that's, uh, you know, and of course trading with my wife, it's a lot of fun. And, uh, you can, I have my contact here if you have any questions uh, or, uh, Linda, you, they could go to lindarashke.net, her website and fill out the contact form. I think if, if you have any questions. Yeah, and I can answer any questions as well. I know that we have a, uh, actually, we do have permission to go over an hour because I think that there is nobody after us. And when you're through with your stuff, Damon, I yep. just had a request just to show one last time a little bit of a stock screen. So, okay. um, I'll that, take two seconds. And, yeah. Yeah. And this is the snapshot of right now live. This is the sell-off, and this is us. You could see volume dies, you know, of course, compared to the close. This is a 30-minute. Well, this is the same chart, and you can see that what happened, we opened up here, we went and tried to get above that. We got above that 
3220.75, which was a swing high from June. Uh, and uh, it was like June 9th or 8th. But we got up there, went above there, but we failed to stay above there. And we started this, you know, re, you know, selling off. We balanced for a while. And then we, once we got below here, we sold off. And just one second, and then I'm going to give it back to Linda. This is how it looks. Even you're going to need to um, post the link for people in the Zoom. Oh, chat that's right. Because, I'll do um, that. I'll do that. Yes. You know what? And I will also post the link to my website that's sort of a blog format. And um, I'll post the link to the website right on the very, I, I only make a post maybe once every five months. I'm not real active, but I will post it up there and then you can get it there as well. Yeah, so let me uh, do this real quick here for you. I'll post the link. By the way, this is how this looks expanded into 30 oh, minutes. Oh, Kyle, our assistant, got it. Thank you, Kyle. Oh, you got it? Did you okay. post it? But I will still make sure that it is up on our website. All right. Well, that's about as much as I could squeeze in in this little time, and I'm going to give it to Linda, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, Let's so see. you have to stop sharing so I can yep. share my screen. And then uh, before we leave, we'll put up the uh, last page again so they get the information. Okay. okay. Yeah, and we'll get we'll get a link over to uh, the direct website there, Kyle. If you can just let me know when you get it on, uh, kind of like we did three months ago at the last event. Uh, if Kyle can, do, if he puts it up on the website there, uh, we can post it directly to the lindrashke.net site uh, as well. So we got multiple ways to get access to you. And then, gang, after Linda gets done here, I'll come back in here and answer all your questions uh, from the day. Uh, as well. So we're going to give Linda some more time here to, uh, to show some more neat stuff and have some fun with them. In the meantime, we will get those links out to you so you guys can join them uh, this coming weekend. All right, Thank back you, over to you. you okay, so all I want to do now, forget all the gobbledygook that you see up there on my screen. That's just for uh, one or two people that asked. And when we are doing this work with the uh, the machine learning, and by the way, there is open source code called TensorFlow. So TensorFlow, and that's what we used as the initial model to build this machine learning uh, application. And we're simply asking it, show us the data points where there is a 90% odds of follow through. Okay, so. I can't process all this during the day, but we write to the API of CQG and also to trade station. So it shows up on a trade station scan that we broadcast during the day on Kyle's video. And so you can actually see all the signals for yourself and pick and choose. And um, there's one or two filters that I won't go into right now where you bypass a signal. But another more important question is asked by somebody, how do you process so much information at once? So I'm just going to leave this up, but I'm not going to go over all these charts. And let me start off by saying that First of all, when I started on the trading floor, we didn't have charts. We didn't have um, the tools that we have now at our disposal. So you stood on the floor and you looked up at these monitors that just had a, um, a lot of price information for all the options because I used to make markets in the equity options. That was my original background. So you uh, start off by just having four markets only and it takes a while to learn to process uh, information. So I always tell people it's like learning to play an instrument, okay? First you learn just to read a few notes and then you might just learn to do, uh, you know, one little scale and it takes a long time for the brain to then feel comfortable with this new language and that's exactly what it is. The charts are a language language of sorts, what the market is trying to communicate to us. Now, if you think about these incredibly talented composers uh, that write the film scores and uh, amazing music, and they have to notate 
all kinds of different instruments and they're not all in the same, you know, scale or register and things. That takes years and years of study. Same thing with a conductor that's conducting a piece of music, you know. You can't just sit there and take six months of a music class in college. You know, you go on, you do your four years, you do your graduate work, you write pieces, you practice, you do internships, on and on. And so that's what you guys are doing with the markets as well. It takes a long time to build up to processing this, but I'll tell you two keys. The first key is see everything in terms of a relationship. So obviously, if you put on a trade, now you have that entry price that you initiated on. And it's very easy to see if the market is going further away or, you know, in the right direction or closer to your price. So it, that is a relationship. Same thing with when we watch the price relative to a previous day's high or low. That's a relationship. The S&Ps relative to the NASDAQ futures, it's a relationship. Or lastly, as somebody was talking about basic, simple momentum divergences. Okay, price makes a higher high, but oscillator makes a lower high. So when you're tape reading or you are doing work with systems, Learn to think about everything in terms of relationships, and that makes it easier to put things in context. The second tip I will give you is uh, something that applies to a lot of different fields, and that is learning to chunk data. So what does chunking data mean? It can be a sea of sensory overload when we look at the markets and there's all these streaming prices and quotes and, and flickering everything under the sun. Uh, we just simply can't process it all. And that's why I think a lot of newer traders get overwhelmed is because they haven't, you learned the importance of chunking data. So by that, I mean breaking it up into little building blocks. So what could be a very simple building block? We can look at the opening 15 minute range. We can look at the first five bars range. So for example, we always look to see in that first 15 minutes if uh, all the indices traded above or below that first five minute bar. And this morning, the NASDAQ was the only one that did not trade below the low of that first five minute bar. So that can give us some information. So chunking things around um, time of day functions. And as an aside, you are not able to process data for longer than 90 minutes at a time without some severe deterioration in your cognitive uh, abilities to process data. So don't think that you have to sit there and, um, you know, eight hours all, all day staring at the tape because what will happen is it'll be like going snow blind. But if instead we can say, okay, we're getting ready towards Europe close, Europe close meaning 1030 central time, that's a way of chunking some data. Okay, and now we're approaching the pit session close for the old crude, you know, and that is a good time of day function. So time of day functions little pieces of data, um, and, and that will help you to learn to process things more uh, expediently. Um, so uh, if, if you want more information on the trading room, just simply go to my website, uh, Linda and lindarashke.net, but you'll see a landing page there, uh, Linda and Damon trade. Um, we do not offer free trials simply because we have so many resources in the members section that are also important for um, you to see when you're going to trade the next day. I have my homework that I do every night. We have worksheets. We have lots of material and videos. So that's part of it. Um, it's an investment in a month. And I think the cost is really, really nominal, you know, and we lecture all the time. I've got recordings of our lunchtime lectures and, uh, you know, all just kinds of fun things like that. And the second problem is, is because 
we have four videos on this Zoom link, and we also have a Discord room. We do Tuesdays and Thursday evenings where people can talk amongst themselves. I have a guest friend, Mandy, who's doing coaching sessions on Monday nights. Wednesday nights, we go through and we look at the stock charts. So we spend each each week, once one night, just looking at the relative strength leaders or perhaps trade ideas on the stocks. And, um, you know, we don't have the ability just to enable or disable, you know, the link for a day or two for an individual. So it just, it, it's way too cumbersome. But I do feel that if somebody was interested, uh, it's all in the good spirit of um, learning to see what other people see. And I, I would be hard pressed to see that you wouldn't walk away with something. Um, and we just have a tremendous uh, supportive community. That's more important to me than anything. You know, we have humor, we joke around on Fridays after the close, Damon plays his guitar, <laughs> lead songs, name that tune, and oh, so forth. Hey, no. so, yeah, okay, so another question. <laughs> this is a good uh, question, and that is how much trading is done by humans versus computers anymore? And that's an important question because I just talked about our algorithmic uh, stuff here that I've got up and actually we have yet another program that can integrate with interactive brokers and do the options you know on a systematic basis but the answer is 85% of the trading is done by machines but I have to put that in context because that includes the algorithms used for execution by large funds and stuff. So it's not strategic algos. You know, they you, obviously everybody knows what the VWAP is. It's kind of like following a moving average. So, for example, when I had my fund and I wanted to execute 300 contracts of coffee, which you really can't do on a discretionary basis, we would feed it into a little algorithm, say, buy 300 contracts over the next five minutes or 10 minutes, you know, buy half on the bid, half on the offer, do it random intervals, do it random prices. And so that is called time slicing. What I'm trying to do is get an average price. So a lot of the execution that's done is exactly with this time slicing algorithm. And here's the other thing. You cannot see that. Okay. So all this nonsense about the footprints and the market delta and the bid and the ask and all this volume that's traded there and, and, and so forth, it's a gimmick. And I'll tell you why. Because we did 90% of our orders on icebergs where you can't see. I could put out 100 contracts and uh, only show 10 at a time, okay? And people do this with 1,000 lots, okay? Obviously, the S&Ps are liquid enough that you don't have to worry about that. But there's a lot of algorithms working in the background. It might say, offer 300, but if 130 trade, then cancel the balance of the offer. This stuff goes on constantly and people aren't aware of it. So it's not like anybody is trying to spoof anybody. So put that out of your mind. It's just, um, you know, trying to see how can we put on positions with minimizing the market impact. And so that's why you see so much algorithmic activity. It's really a way to minimize the market impact and you'll never know if it's opening or closing. So keep that in mind as well. So don't try and read into whatever you think you see on the bid and the ask, because I promise you 80% of that is not real. So um, don't, you know, just be careful about not getting tripped up in the noise. And instead, think about getting the main idea right. 
Okay, so, uh, you know, the main idea, right, are we going to be able to come back down and trade to close the gap? You know, are we going to trade back down to Friday's highs? Are we going to go through it? And if we do, then where so? All right. So that's the most important thing. Get the main idea right. And um, let me tell you guys another thing with this artificial intelligence stuff. I mean... <laughs> It is not, it's not like it's smarter than us. It's only as good as the questions that you ask it and the data that you train it on. And it can lose money too, trust me. Um, so it's, uh, I use it as a model. I use it to sort through filters and signals. And um, so here's a good example for you. Neural networks are best used as pattern classifiers. Let's call it that. And I'll give you a great example. The U.S. Post Office. For example, when you address an envelope and drop that into the mailbox, it doesn't get read by an individual that sorts it according to which state it's going to and so forth. It's all read by artificial intelligence that can see Okay, here is the letter A. We have 10,000 examples of how that letter A is written. That's what it does. And so that's sort of what these, um, you know, the best uses of these neural nets are. They're pattern classifiers. So I can feed in, you know, 2,000 samples of a particular pattern because, as you well know, nothing repeats itself exactly. There are a zillion variations on everything. So, you know, that's all you're doing is flagging a potential pattern. It's not going to say, here's where you put your stop, here's where I suggest you exit. You can go there, but then you'll find that if you specify, okay, exit after that 90% probability threshold has dropped off, you're basically exiting the next day because, yes, sometimes we get these runs of uh, five, six days in a row, but what you need to do is ask it every data point then. Every daily data point is what I do, but it's... When we look at the markets, guys, we can't predict or forecast too far out. It's very much a Bayesian approach. So the five-minute chart makes its move. And then what's the next five-minute move going to be? And then what's the next swing going to be? Always just one swing at a time. You see? So, um, you know, this stuff about being able to predict and forecast and so forth it, even if you have the best artificial intelligence in the world, it doesn't do it. It's not a prediction tool per se. It just tells us, okay, you've got a 90% edge that the next data point will be plus or minus. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what am I saying about um, gimmicky with footprints and so forth and so forth? Um, just show me one person's actual real-time account statement that shows a positive, you know, run of three months where they are trading with this stuff. You know, I think there are a lot of very talented traders out there, but I would, you know, and maybe they can use some information like that as supporting information. Um, but you guys also understand that there's a huge industry out there just trying to figure out what is the next little um, gimmicky thing to sell you? And then you have to say, it's, it's not gimmicky. There might be value in it. Um, what I found is that when I looked at the, the, uh, some of these tools, uh, if you see uh, volume divergences, say, for example, a volume divergence is 95% correlated with an oscillator divergence, okay? So you could, I use the difference between a three and 10 period, simple moving average. You could use an RSI or a stochastic. It really doesn't matter because they are all derivatives of price, but you know, they are gonna be 95% correlated with a volume divergence. Now, 
you as a trader have a job and that is to reduce down the number of variables that you look at during the day because we simply cannot process that many variables. So if you have one indicator that's giving you uh, something and something else is 95% correlated, get rid of the other one. Keep one or the other, okay? But don't use them both. I love dear Arch Crawford, and he was the one that always said, um, give me a watch and I can tell you what time of day it is. Give me two watches and I'll never know exactly what time of day it is. You see, so when you start to add in redundant layers, okay, it's going to add in confusion, uh, stirs up the muddy waters where if I just said here, you just have to watch price relative to one moving average, you would probably do much better than if I said watch price relative to all these different things, okay? So uh, there you go. There you go. Okay, you want to know my little paint bars? That's a great question. I'll show you my little paint bars because, like I said, I have nothing to hide. Everything is in the public domain. And this little rule here is uh, derived by Wells Wilder, okay? So he published a book that is, I think, 25 years ago. And it's, you know, he was the author that published the parabolic, the volatility stop and reverse system, which this is a function of. So you can see here that the bar turns red when it moves X number of ATRs off of that high or the close. You can use either one, all right? So the purple is simply when it closes outside the Keltner channels as it did here on this silver chart. And when we get that, then we can look for the little bit of a divergence on the further push up and boom, revert back to the mean, which silver likes to do very quickly because everybody likes to be long silver, not short it. So <laughs> it's always going to see if it can trap longs. So if I show you one other little tool, and all of these tools are CAN tools, I would not be surprised if, um, if Rob Hoffman can add these types of indicators to his new platform that he's got. And I'm just going to simply put this up. This is CQG, okay? And there'll be something here, zigzag. Okay, so now you see that this is a different indicator than my paint bars, but it's really, really similar. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply make all these things go away so we can only see the structure and it just helps us to decipher the fact that here we we formed our coil our value area where we did numerous trades around one price and now we are in an uptrend simply because we have higher highs and higher lows. And so you want to stay that way until you don't, okay? Until the last flag is going to be the one that doesn't work. So you have to be careful of that last flag in a market. So higher lows, higher highs. This is a copper market, 120 minute time frame. I got rid of our little color rules, but now you see how from a conceptual standpoint and context, it can be of great value. And if we put in a lower high, and then you've got a little pivot point here that you'll see a lot of volume come in. So that's all. All right, um, this is just the Keltner channel, so don't be confused by that. And uh, yeah, keep it simple, you know, and different things work for different people. So uh, that's the nice thing about when you come to something like these um, webinars that Rob Hoffman um, presents and hosts is that you get to see 
all different sorts of ways that people process information. And then your job is just to cherry pick the things that make most sense to you and put together your own little way of processing data because nobody's going to be able to do it like I am. Nobody's going to be able to do it like Damon is. I'm sure Rob has the same, you know, the things that he likes to look at. But now you can say, ah, that makes sense. Let me start off and see if I can start off with this one simple tool. And that's your initial building block. Remember, we talked about you, you can't write an orchestral composition, you know, all at once. You have to learn one instrument at a time. And so that's what you're doing here. Um, so there you go. Um, Wells Wilder, all you have to do is Google, uh, what was it? He, he also wrote this Delta thing like later. I don't know why he went into lunar stuff, uh, but his first book was really uh, the one that he is known for, New Concepts in Technical Trading Systems. And um, I believe that came out like at least, at least 25 years ago. And, uh, you know, you'll get some really great ideas Keep in mind, none of this stuff is going to turn out to be a little printing machine for you, okay? But it just provides you with tools that then you can add. So I just uh, put this up here. I Googled it on Amazon. Um, personally, I always am able to find used books on Amazon and so forth. Uh, so... Um, there you go. Okay, so we don't have anybody else left after us. We are going to turn this back over to Rob so he can answer questions. And um, thank you guys so much for joining Damon and I. You know, in the past, we've always done uh, separate presentations. And so uh, it's, this is only the second time that we've actually uh, done a joint one. So thank you for our patience with us. I'm going to just put this back up one more time. New concepts in technical trading systems. But I'll bet you 10 to 1 that if you Google this kind of stuff on the internet, you will find excerpts or chapters. Um, the main thing I found of value is this average true range volatility stop and reverse system. So there you go, gang. God bless you and enjoy the rest of the week because volatility is here to stay. Ha, ha, ha.